welcome this afternoon to uh, the Evolving Solutions 2024 Top Technology Trends webinar. Uh, as we go forward today, you're going to get the pleasure of hearing from uh, Michael Downs, who is on with me. Michael is our Chief Technology Officer. And then later, we will have some fun with some wine tasting with Aaron Swain. Uh, for you who may know Aaron, she's joined us in a few other events in the past and is backed by popular demand. So looking forward to having her. And Michael, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. And as we, uh, as we start off here, uh, for those of you that are familiar with Evolving Solutions and our current clients, we appreciate your time, we appreciate your business and your partnership. For those of you that may be newer to uh, the Evolving Solutions team, welcome and thanks for spending some time with us. My name is Bo Gebby and I'm president of Evolving Solutions. So I am uh, coming at you live right now from Omaha, Nebraska, where I'm at part-time and Michael is up in our headquarters in, in Minneapolis. And uh, we've got teams joining us from uh, from throughout the U.S., so we appreciate your time again. Hopefully, those of you that have worked with us know about Evolving Solutions, know about our team, our capabilities. At the end of the day, we are a technology-led organization focused on helping our clients really modernize and automate their mission crit critical technology infrastructure applications. You know, really, what does that mean? We focus in on modern operations. How do we help you save the, save time, money, resources from just keeping the lights on and running technology, you know, day to day, to really helping you focus on outcome driven decisions and making sure your technology supports your business's growth and being more competitive in the in the marketplace. So we do that across a variety of solutions and technologies. We're going to talk about some of those today uh, for what Michael and I see as uh, some trends for 2024. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started here. All right, well, we figured we'd get this out of the way. There was no way we were gonna have a presentation on trends and not talk about AI. So I, we thought we'd just jump right in with this. Um, I think everybody knows that this has become the hot, uh, hot buzzword for the last uh, about 15 months now. I think AI is sort of in the same place that cloud was about 15 years ago. And most of our organizations and businesses are going to be relying on their IT organizations and reaching out to them in 15 months, 15 years ago it was, what's our cloud strategy? Now it's going to be, what's our AI strategy? Uh, so a uh, very important place for everybody to start getting comfortable and start being able to have conversations. And there's a few things that I wanted to make sure that I called out on this. Um, we've really talked about how commoditized platforms and systems have been for quite a while. AI changes that and not just because of GPUs, uh, because of the nature of AI, where you're training a model to do something, uh, to gain some inference or to give you some suggestions or to provide you insights, uh, there's a particular kind of compute, oftentimes cloud-based or in large data centers, uh, that works great for that. And there's another kind of compute, uh, usually either right at the edge or right near where you're trying to make that inference that works much better for being able to make those decisions. Uh, I heard about a client in a presentation yesterday who is trying to provide automated recommendation for, uh, for fries literally at the time that an order is being placed. There's no way that that can handle the latency of going all the way back to the cloud to make the decision. So having infrastructure that can support both training a model and being able to deploy a model and being able to get the business outcomes that you're looking for is really critical. Uh, we talked a bit about modern operations, as well mentioned it. Modern operations is all about being able to provide resilient, secure, high-performing, um, and uh, extensible IT, adaptable IT. So being able to do that is basically a foundation for AI. If you can't do those things, then you aren't going to be able to adapt to the needs that the business has. Everybody's looking for that killer app that they need in order to be able to do something new and different with AI. When your business finds it, they're going to be looking at the IT organization to be able to make sure that it's running and that it's secure and that it meets the regulatory requirements that are, that are gonna be in place as well. And then finally, incorporating generative AI is all the rage. I think everyone knows AI has been around for a long time. We've been talking about AI for, a long, for quite a while. Uh, I think uh, it was over 10 years ago now that uh, Watson won Jeopardy uh, so that's a that's a very you know ex very extended period of time. What's really happened is that generative AI has extended the AI capabilities inside of IT operations. I uh, heard a good explanation of this yesterday, which is really that generative AI lowered the barrier to everyone becoming a programmer. With IT infrastructure being more and more programmable, 
being able to just tell an AI what you would like to have, the outcome that you would like, and having that be able to go out and be executed is going to become extremely powerful. So I'll turn it over to you, Bodo, to go on to our next trend. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. And Michael gets to start with the fun one, the thing that everybody talks about, AI. And I get to start with uh, the least fun one, uh, but regulations and laws and all the fun stuff that we all get to deal with. And you see, is this a tech trend? It absolutely is. And, uh, you know, our world is moving so fast. Um, it is hard, it becoming harder and harder for governments and regulators to keep up with the pace of technology. But as we look at 24, we see three key areas where we're going to continue to have to evolve how technology organizations and leaders are supporting your companies and the risk, pro the, the regulations and the laws that are really a hodgepodge. And if you're an international organization or even just a national organization doing state business in many states across the U.S., it is a myriad. Uh, there are a myriad of uh, regulations and changes happening. So when we think about data privacy, obviously GDPR has been around in the EU since 2018. The United States version of that, or the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, has not uh, been passed into law yet. So what we're seeing now are states taking uh, those data privacy regulations into their own hands. So as of uh, this year, as of January, 13 states have already passed their own comprehensive data privacy regulations uh, that are going to go into effect between now and 2026. Expect to see more states uh, introducing data privacy legislation in their legislatures this year uh, and that we're all going to have to comply with across, the, across the, all of the states that we work in. As we think about AI, it is moving so fast. Michael just talked about you know, some of the challenges that are out there and what we see is the opportunity, obviously, but it's changing so fast. How do you keep up with that? How do the governments keep up with that? Uh, the EU is probably the farthest ahead. They uh, have introduced uh, legislation that uh, has been agreed to in principle, and the, it'll go to enact a, a vote of parliament after committees here, probably be passed in I would, sometime here in 2024, maybe even in the first half. Uh, again, U.S. will be behind that, but what we're already seeing in the U.S. are states introducing AI laws as well. So, in the uh, as of now, 26, 25 states and Puerto Rico have introduced legislation regarding AI and regarding safety, equity, opting out, ensuring human inter uh, uh, oversight. Uh, and already 18 of those plus Puerto Rico have actually passed legislation. So there's some that's still in in uh, committee, if you will, and then more states are going to introduce legislation here this year. And then finally, cybersecurity. We all know the fun of going through the uh, audits with our cyber insurance companies. It's going to get harder and more complex. Uh, the SEC, for those of you that are public companies, uh, introduced a new final rule in 23 that really accelerates uh, the time that organizations have to report a material impact or material event. What is material event? Nobody really knows. You saw Microsoft just last week uh, announce some things or do a filing with the SEC and outside uh, with press release as well. And they did it on the abundance of caution. They said, we're doing it in the spirit of the law because material, you know, there still is a lot of ambiguity around that term. So it's getting harder for us to even know when to report things. And then finally, for those of you that are familiar with NIST or the National Institute, uh, of standards and technology, NIST 1 and NIST 1.0, 1 and 1.1 have been uh, out there for many years. NIST 2.0 uh, should be really released here in the first part of this year. Public comment phase ended, but that uh, in late last year, and it's going to be published here this year. This updated version is really just designed to be used by organizations of all sizes, from education to Fortune 5 companies and everything in between really to focus on the cybersecurity framework. And so there's going to be a lot of new rules or guidelines coming out from this 2.0. That's going to see, we're going to see that trickle down into how we um, have to report things and also what our, really our cyber insurance companies are going to be expecting of us. So without the, that's all the fun stuff around the laws. Let's, uh, let's pass up back over to Michael to talk about some of the uh, technology enhancements. So what do you get when you combine AI and DevOps? Well, you get, AI ops. So uh, there, this is a space that has been growing and percolating for a long time now. Um, what I find so interesting about this, I, I did an interview uh, about a year ago now, and the interviewer asked me how far along if AI ops was a baseball game, where what inning would we be in? 
Uh, and at the time, I think I said we were probably in the fourth inning or so. And my, my reason for that is I think we've done a pretty good job of figuring out how to gather a lot of information. But I define AI ops as the ability to gather all that data, be able to make uh, gain good information from it by being able to apply analytics against it, and then having an automated way to respond uh, and be able to make changes and adaptations to your IT environment to be able to get better outcomes for your business. Uh, so there are really three bullets that I sort of see happening in this space right now. One is that a lot of different product providers, uh, vendors, and companies are battling for who's going to own the data. Um, and so and who's going to own the analytics to, that go with the data? So if you think about it, you've got APM solutions that are gathering application data, they're gathering function call data, all kinds of different telemetry. You've got uh, tools like uh, Open Telemetry that are, that's gathering data from across uh, a large environment. You've got security tools like SIM tools that are gathering information. Uh, you've got all kinds of different uh, standard tools that are gathering network and other kinds of data flow information. All of that's coming together being able to put it in one place so that you can do analytics against it, and then be able to abstract those analytics so that a variety of consumers can choose to use it the way that they want to is an ongoing struggle that I think we're gonna to continue to see play out over the next, uh, or next three to four years. Um, ideally, that same set of information gets to be consumed by security specialists, by application developers, by IT operations and SRE teams. I think that there's a lot of work to do there and there's going to be a continued struggle to to get to the best options to that for every business that's out there. Uh, we've also seen a very uh, rapid growth in generative tools to support IT operations. I mentioned earlier the ability to ask a system to be able to generate code for you, and this is already starting to happen. Um, we, there are tools in the marketplace already uh, that are extending uh, classic platforms like the Microsoft Developer Tool Suite, extending Ansible, uh, even extending some mainframe programming tools to allow you to more in natural language ask for the things that you'd like to have happen. To be able to get autocomplete and those kinds of things has been there for a long time, but to actually get usable code that you can then go evaluate and determine if it actually meets your needs uh, is a huge step forward. And then finally, there's going to be continued integration between automation and the insights that are coming from various observability tools. And I think this is key, being able to automate that workflow so that you can not only be able to make decisions to go ahead and change a configuration to respond to a security threat, but also to be able to have some of those things more intelligently understood so that some of those things can happen without human intervention and that we're comfortable with that taking place. I think those are the main things that I think will happen in AI, with AI ops in 2024. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. As we talk about, uh, you know, what's next, uh, we think about automation and you may say, well, we've been doing automation forever. Yes, but is it actually, are we, uh, has it permeated every, every type and every part of our technology environment? And I would say automation is more important now than ever. Uh, Without automation, there no, is no artificial intelligence. And what we mean by that is, unless you're automating and uh, the, the correct tasks, the, the correct data sets, the correct, correct workflows, you're not gonna be able to set up or really drive the true value out of your AI investments and your focus there. Automation is gonna be key to successful AI deployments and getting the right insights out of, out of that data. Absolutely. And also, as we think about automation, you, know, you, might, you see technical debt on here, you may wonder why that is. Well, automation is key to continuing to get rid of what's holding us back. You know, we, there is so much technical debt out there. According to Forbes, almost about 70% of technology leaders view technical debt as a hindrance to their organization's ability to innovate and move forward. Automation can help with that, right? We have so many folks spending time on things that they don't need to. We have so much technical debt that is spending time and money just keeping it going. Automation can help us address that and really drive that 70%, you know, uh, or that, that high level that's being spent just on running the on running the technology that's not driving the value, really get that more optimized so that we can spend the time and money doing the fun stuff, really growing the business and, and driving technology to make uh, make our businesses grow. And the other one that's on here is you think about upskilling and reskilling. Most data says that there were 200 to 250,000 layoffs last year in the tech sector. 
but I would guess that many of you are still challenged with finding deep expertise across uh, you know, the hard technologies, enterprise architecture, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, observability. Automation can help us with that. If we're really focused on, let's automate the rudimentary things or the things that are taking up our staff's time that they don't need to be focused on, now we can actually maybe go spend some time on reskilling and upskilling our staff to go focus on uh, the emerging technologies that are gonna help us grow and help us be more competitive. And it is, as I think most of us would agree, it's a lot cheaper, a lot more cost effective, I should say, to retain and grow our existing talent than it is to go hire and recruit new talent. Automation is key to that. Let's go get rid of the stuff that's not driving value for our teams and spend the time really educating and upskilling them to go focus on the future with us. And then everything that we're talking about today, whether it's AI, whether it's FinOps, whether it's AI ops, all rely on automation to realize their full value. If we, you know, we talk about modern operations, if we're still running our environments like we were 10 years ago, we're not gonna be able to exploit the full value of the emerging technologies uh, where we're trying to spend our time and, uh, and invest our money in. So automation is key to making all of these technologies work in a more seamless and cohesive fashion. And as we move forward, Michael, you know, talked about AI ops. And as you think about all of the, uh, all the ops that are out there as we think about DevSecOps and uh, data ops, ML ops, Git ops, FinOps is one that doesn't, I don't think get its uh, uh, day in the sunshine enough, but it is one of the most powerful frameworks that we can encourage our teams and our clients, our organizations to leverage. Uh, and FinOps is really the, uh, I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's, Semi easy if you think about a public cloud environment, which is really where you know FinOps uh, has has started and has, the focus has been. It's really about establishing an operational framework uh, and the cultural shift uh, as you think about bringing technology, finance, and operations together, really to drive financial accountability and oversight and insights into the public cloud spend. Uh, but Michael and I would uh, surmise that uh, FinOps has been is generally put in a corner with public cloud or it's put in a box thinking it really around the public cloud spend. However, probably 60, 70, 80% of uh, critical workloads, depending on who you ask, is still running in within the four walls of our organizations. 60 to 80% of critical data and applications are still within our data centers. Why are we not extending the thought and the culture and the mindset and the tools and the, the, the business valuation of FinOps, why are we just thinking about public cloud? Why are we not thinking about it from a hybrid cloud perspective? Um, obviously, when you are in the public cloud or in a hyperscaler, you're getting a monthly bill or you might be getting 100 monthly bills, quite honestly. However, you're still getting a bill and you can see the true cost there. However, it's a lot harder in a hybrid environment. You've got to figure out the right tools and process to really drive uh, the insights to understand the financial investments that you, know, you are spending and making uh, in that hybrid environment. However, if you can figure that out and we can help you figure that out, the insights that you gain from that are going to be extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, and it's because you're finally, this is where it comes together. We always talk about technology driving business value. How do you measure that? How do you get the right insights into that? FinOps is the structure, it's the framework, it's the culture, it's the set of tools, uh, and it's the KPIs and the metrics to really understand that true uh, that true value. As we think about automation that we just talked about, automation is key to ensuring a seamless uh, methodology to be able to track all of this. And uh, you know, technology leaders are becoming more and more. You're not only a technology leader; you're a security leader, you're a people leader, but most importantly, you're a financial leader. And really, tech driving technology. Uh, are, are, the, are we measuring technology in the appropriate way to show the outcomes and what we're doing to grow the business? FinOps is going to be your key to that. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think FinOps is, uh, you mentioned that technology leaders have got so many hats to wear. And clearly, I think none of them has become more prevalent in the last few years than the security hat. Uh, finance is uh, starting to become a bigger and bigger challenge for many people, especially uh, this year where, where we're seeing some constraints on, uh, on growth uh, and also making asking people to make hard choices about whatever they want to spend their technology dollars 
Uh, and we've actually, frankly, seen this continue into security where people are having to make hard choices about security. Uh, but there are a couple of trends that are particularly important as we think about this cybersecurity in general. One is zero trust. Um, zero trust is not just a buzzword. I think we think it might be, but it's actually a framework that's been well-defined by, uh, by NIST as part of the CIS framework. And one of the things that uh, that is really important is that it extends not just to network, it goes all the way from identity to applications to data, and it covers the entire gambit of how we deliver IT services to our clients. I think the big, biggest challenge for zero trust is the most, uh, used to be the running joke that the most secure computer was the one that wasn't plugged in. Um, there was a time at which that actually made sense, I suppose, but uh, clearly everything connected uh, that's no longer an option. So being able to enable zero trust where we're trusting no one and nothing and still getting the business done, still being able to deliver value and still allowing developers and the people who build out innovation to be able to move forward uh, is a critical piece, critical challenge of zero trust that we're working with clients to, to make happen. And really making that framework actionable is one of the biggest challenges we see. There are a lot of approaches to this. I mentioned identity, network, application, data. There are a lot of different places that you can start and they each have their own sets of tools. There are frameworks out there. There are platforms out there that can allow you to look at zero trust and address those challenges, but making sure that the right framework and the right tools and the right processes and people are in place for your organization is a critical piece of being successful with this and making it actionable. And the other thing that we're seeing in zero trust is really this expansion from the idea of you only trust, uh, not trusting individuals to all of the interconnected services and microservices we see. Clearly microservices uh, and a cloud-based cloud native architecture is the go forward strategy for anyone doing innovation. Building a new application without taking a microservices approach is something we're simply not seeing anyone undertake. The flexibility it gives you, the ability to deliver a minimum viable product and be able to actually get quick feedback from your users, from your consumers, those values can't be, uh, can't be set aside just because you're trying to deliver some of the sort of other operational capabilities. And so the operational capabilities have to adapt to that, including zero trust. So understanding how we get to a zero trust environment that still allows interactivity between applications and services is another gigantic challenge that we see with zero trust that we're working with our clients to address. And finally, for our last trend, we're gonna continue with our security theme and talk about cyber resilience. Really cyber resilience uh, is a, is a well-defined term that a lot of organizations are dealing with, trying to make sure that your, uh, your organization is hardened and not at risk uh, from an external actor that could potentially cause problems inside of your business. I like to think of it, honestly, as the evolution of business continuity and disaster recovery. I think a lot of us in IT have spent a long time thinking about what happens if a tornado hits that data center? What happens if a backhoe takes that cable out between my data center and other parts? What's my re uh, recovery time objective? All those things have become sort of embedded parlance into how we uh, talk about, uh, about disaster recovery and business continuity. Cyber resilience acknowledges the next step of that, which is that there are many, many malicious actors out there who are trying to deliberately cause these problems instead of them being accidental or inadvertent or maybe caused by some single rogue employee that we can quickly identify and shut down. It's an ongoing threat to the ability of our business to continue. And cyber resilience is the key to being able to make that happen. Um, the other thing that goes with that is being able to rapidly uh, secure the digital innovation that's happening inside of our businesses. So as businesses adopt SaaS frameworks, as businesses adopt AI, how you protect that data, how you protect those workloads and make them resilient is part of what makes cyber resilience so important. Being able to extend from just the classic disaster recovery to being able to make sure the business is always on, always up across all these new platforms. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that we've seen this renewed emphasis on, re on speed of recovery. Because of ransomware um, and because of other kinds of 
malicious attacks that have potentially taken a business offline for extended period. Back to Bo's point earlier around regulatory requirements and trying to define what a material breach is. Uh, being able to go from being out of business or sidelines to being able to be back in business is a critical piece of this. The, there are numerous stories in 2023 around organizations who've had to report to the SEC that they have a material impact on their earnings as a result of a cyber attack. Being able to shift from an environment that simply provides recovery and consistency to being able to either be on as continuously as possible or recover as quickly as you possibly can is a critical piece of cyber resilience. And so, Bo, I think that is uh, our list of seven, seven. <laughs> technology trend, and trends for uh, 2024. Yes, sir. And I think about it, and all of us on the call, we've all heard these things. We all know they're important. However, I think this is the time where we're going to see the convergence of so many of these trends, investments coming together. You know, automation is key to AI. Automation is key to zero trust and ensuring that we're securing, you know, securing our environments. Automation is key to ensuring that we're resilient. It's, you know, FinOps is key to understanding how we drive value to our business. All of these things have laws, rules, uh, and regulations that are changing by the day. Uh, and AI, automation, uh, you know, resilience, secure access for the right individuals, they're all key to make sure that our teams are doing the right things at the right time with the right objectives. So there are some meaty topics here and meaty things that uh, companies need to invest in. We know it's not all going to be perfect by the, you know, by the end of 24. Where are you on your roadmap? Where are you on your journey? Where have you made investments that you can augment? Where have you trained up teams that you can continue to upskill? You know, it's it's a journey, as we all know, um, and we're here to help. So if there's things that we can be doing, feel free to reach out to your team, to Michael, to myself. We'd love to have a conversation. Also, if you're having successes, we would love to learn from you because it's so helpful to uh, for us to understand where clients and organizations are having success across industries so we can share best practices with uh, with other folks in the industry as well. So as we wrap up again, I want to say thank you for joining us for the last half hour. Thank you for staying on for the next part. Uh, thank you for your business and your partnership uh, and we're welcome to feedback. So feel free to reach out at any time. 